All right, what's up everybody? In this video, we're going to be doing the OMM special diagnostic tests. Now, just to be clear for anybody who's watching this, generally speaking, this is very high yield for Comlex, so this is gonna be for the DO students, but some of these things could still show up on USMLE, not most of them, but some of them can. And certainly if you're planning to go into a field like orthopedics or PMNR, or sports medicine, then this is pretty good information to know because this will be useful to you clinically in the future. But as far as USMLE versus Comlex, this is very high yield for the OMM section of Comlex. So if you're looking at this video and you're like, do I need to know this? The answer is if you're a DO student, overwhelmingly yes. And if you're an MD student, probably not. So let's get started. We're gonna start with the drawer tests. So there's two drawer tests. There's anterior and posterior. And the anterior and posterior drawer tests are pretty much exactly the same. Really the only difference is the direction of translation from the tibia. So in the anterior drawer test, the examiner will hold the patient's tibia and move it or translate it anteriorly. And then in the posterior drawer test, it's the same thing, but opposite. It's going to be directed posteriorly. An excessive glide would indicate to you that either the ACL in the anterior drawer test or the PCL in the posterior drawer test has pathology. Okay, so these are two tests to test for ACL and PCL damage. And the way that you can remember this is if you have difficulty remembering that the anterior drawer and the posterior drawer are for ACL and PCL is to remember drawing the tibia forward or backward. It's pretty easy. Another test for the ACL is the Lachman test. And the Lachman test is very similar to the anterior drawer test. In the Lachman, you have one hand on the tibia and the other hand on the thigh. And really the only difference here is that the knee in this test is only flexed to about 20 or 30 degrees. And just like the anterior drawer test, if there's excessive glide, then that's a positive test and signifies that there's ACL damage. And the way that you can remember this one is that the ACL safely locks the knee. Locks for Lockman. Lastly, we've got the McMurray test. And in the McMurray test, the hand positioning is pretty unique. So you've got one hand palpating the lateral meniscus and the other hand is on the base of the foot. And what you want to do at the foot is internal rotation and then at the knee, you want to apply varus stress and extend the knee. And if you feel, if the patient feels pain over the lateral meniscus or you hear an audible clicking sound, that's going to be positive for meniscus pathology. So you need to remember that the McMurray test is looking at the meniscus. And the way that I remember the McMurray test is that instead of saying McMurray, I say click Murray because meniscus is click and it tells you about meniscus pathology the other way you can remember this is instead of saying meniscus you can say menis click because if you hear the clicking noise then you've got pathology in the lateral meniscus so mcmurray click murray meniscus menis click easy done last tests for the knee are going to be your valgus and your varus stress tests and these are pretty easy to remember because the name is telling you exactly what's happening here so in the valgus stress test, you're applying valgus stress, which is directed medially toward the MCL. And in the varus stress test, you're directing varus stress laterally toward the LCL. An excessive gapping, which basically means that that joint space is opening up, or pain in the MCL or LCL signifies a positive test, and therefore pathology at the MCL or LCL. So if you haven't noticed already, there are a lot of different tests that can be applied at the knee. Because again, in the knee, you've got meniscus, LCL, MCL, ACL, PCL. You've got a lot of structures that can be very easily damaged. So there's a lot of different tests at the knee. Speaking of tests at the knee, we need to know about the Apley test. And, and technically, the correct way to write this out uh, would be the Apley compression test or the Apley distraction test. And the reason that it's either aptly compression or aptly distraction is because there's two different variations of this test which are actually testing for two different things. So on one hand, we can test for a meniscal injury, and on the other hand, we can test for a ligamentous injury. Now, the way that this works is the patient is prone and the knee is flexed to 90 degrees, and you grab their tibia, and you basically are going to rotate that tibia. And while rotating the tibia by using the foot,
you're going to apply one of two different forces. You're either going to distract or pull the foot and the, the tibia away from the table, or you're going to compress and push the foot and the tibia toward the table. Now, if the patient feels pain when the foot and the tibia is rotating during the compression force, that's a meniscal injury because in the compression force, you're going toward the knee, toward the meniscus. But if the patient feels pain or has increased rotation on the distraction component when you're pulling the foot slash tibia away from the table, that signifies a ligamentous injury because as you distract and pull that tibia away from the table, you're putting more stress on those ligaments. So the Apley test can be Apley compression, which is testing for a meniscal injury, which would show decreased rotation when you compress, or the Apley distraction test which is testing for a ligamentous injury, which would show increased rotation when you distract. So those two subtleties and the nuances between the meniscal versus the ligamentous component are very important to understand. Don't have a great mnemonic here, but you need to understand the Apley test. The Sperling test is testing for radiculitis. And the way that this works is that the patient will turn their head toward the ipsilateral side and the physician will gently extend the neck, just a teeny bit, and apply downward pressure. And if the radiculitis symptoms are produced when this is happening, that's a positive Sperling test. Okay, so the Sperling test is testing for radiculitis. Now, the way that I, that I remember this is that spur, Sperling, reminds me of bone spur. So I say that there's a bone spur in the neck which causes radiculitis. You absolutely need to know what these tests are are actually testing for. The Adson test is testing for thoracic outlet syndrome. And the way that this one works is that the patient is seated and their arm is slightly abducted and extended. And the physician monitors or palpates the radial pulse and then extends the patient's neck and has the patient rotate their neck to the ipsilateral side. So in this uh, drawing, you see that the, the physician is standing to the right of the patient. So the patient would extend their neck and then rotate their head to the right to face the physician. And as the patient does this, you instruct them to take a deep breath in. And when they do that, if the radial pulse diminishes, which you would know because you're palpating it, that's a positive Adson test, and it signifies the presence, possibly, of thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, the way that I remember this is instead of saying thoracic outlet syndrome, I say Thoradson outlet syndrome, which reminds me that the Adson test tests for thoracic outlet syndrome. Very simple, very easy to remember. Our next test is the vertebral artery test. So you could see this written as the Wallenberg test, or you might see this written out as the vertebral artery test. It means the same thing. This test is testing for vertebrobasilar insufficiency. So how does this work? The patient is supine and they undergo gentle passive extension of the head. And then their head gets rotated to one side where it's held for about 30 seconds. And during that hold period, if symptoms of VBI or vertebrobasilar insufficiency occur, that's a positive Wallenberg test, which signifies again, vertebral basilar insufficiency. Because when you put that neck into extension, you kind of pinch off some of those arteries. And if the blood supply decreases to a certain threshold and you get the production of those symptoms, that's a positive test. So you'll see things like perhaps dizziness, vertigo, nystagmus, etc. Now the way to remember this is that you need to know that this test, the Wallenberg, is testing for vertebral basilar insufficiency. Because think about it, on an exam, if they say vertebral artery test, you probably be able to figure out that you're testing for vertebral basilar insufficiency because vertebral is in the name. But if they give you Wallenberg test, you need a way to remember that Wallenberg is testing for VBI. So instead of saying Wallenberg, I say Wallenberg. And the V, B, and I in Wallenberg reminds me of VBI, vertebral basilar insufficiency. So you need to know it, and that's my way to remember that. The right test. Okay, so how does this one work? So the patient's supine, and you abduct and externally rotate their arm. And while you're doing this, you palpate the radial pulse. And as the patient's arm gets abducted and externally rotated, if that radial pulse diminishes, the Wright's test is telling you that there's thoracic outlet syndrome. And what's happening here is that when the arm is abducted and externally rotated, as you can see in this image, the neurovascular bundle can be pinched off 
by a lot of different structures. So it could be the pec minor, it could be the head of the humerus, it could be the coracoid. There's a lot of stuff in that area. So if one of those structures pinches off the neurovascular bundle, therefore causing a diminished pulse that you're palpating, that tells you that the thoracic outlet is um, the problem. So that's right test. And the way to remember this is that right is testing for tight. So if that area is very tight and you get thoracic outlet syndrome, the right test will tell you that it's too tight around the neurovascular bundle. Now we've got the aptly scratch test. So don't confuse this with the aptly compression or the aptly distraction test. This is the aptly scratch test. And, and to be honest, I don't really know why this shows up on exams because this is really just a way to test range of motion particularly of the rotator cuff. So you can have the patient perform two different motions. One is where they reach kind of like behind their head and try to touch the opposite scapula. That's testing for range of motion of abduction and external rotation. And then the other motion is to put the arm kind of down and across their back, trying to touch the inferior spine of the scapula. And when they do that, you're just testing their range of motion for adduction and internal rotation. And you know, I, the way that I remember this is if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And aptly scratch shows you that you're putting your hand across your back to test range of motion. Now let's talk about speeds test. Speed test is testing for pathology in the bicipital groove. So that could be something like bicipital tendinitis. And the way that this one works is the patient will extend their elbow and supinate their hand. So they'll basically stick their arm straight out with their palm facing up and they'll try to raise that arm up superiorly. And as they do that, the physician will apply passive resistance. And if there's pain felt in the bicipital tendon or the bicipital groove, as the patient moves their arm up, or later you could do another version of this test where they try to move their hand down, that's positive speed test, which tells you that there's pathology in the bicipital groove because that's the area where all the stress or the force will be applied in this motion. So what you need to remember is that the speed test is testing for bicipital tendinitis. So you got to remember speed. And when I think about speed, I think about SP, 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 speed. So instead of saying bicipital tendinitis, I say bicipital testinitis, which reminds me of speed test, bicipital testinitis. And that's your speed test. The drop arm test is super simple. The name tells you exactly what's going on. This test is testing for rotator cuff path pathology. So how this works is that the patient just holds their arm straight out in abduction and slowly lowers it. They drop their arm as the test implies. And if there's a sudden drop in their arm as they're, so they're supposed to slowly lower their arm, but if the arm just like kind of boom drops to the floor and they have a little bit of discomfort or pain, that's a positive test and it signifies rotator cuff pathology. So if their arm drops, the drop arm test is positive. So super simple. Let's just move on. That's a stupid one to have a mnemonic for. Let's talk about the Jurgensen test. So the Jurgensen test is testing for two different things. It's either biceps tendon pathology or what's known as a SLAP, S-L-A-P, SLAP lesion, which just stands for superior labral anterior posterior lesion. And the way that this works is the patient's arm or their elbow will be slightly flexed and their hand will be pronated. And then what you want them to do against the resistance of the physician is externally rotate and supinate the hand. So they want to try to externally rotate and supinate the hand while you resist them. And as you're doing this, you want to keep your other hand as the physician up on the biceps tendon, palpating it. And if there's a painful sensation in that region or a snapping sound, that's a positive Jurgensen test. So that could indicate to you that there's either biceps tendon pathology or a slap lesion. Let's wrap up by talking about the Finkelstein test or the Finkelstein. I don't know how you say this person's name. The Finkelstein test is testing for decurvanes tenosynovitis, and that's going to be in the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. The way that this works is you instruct the patient to flex their thumb and tuck it into their fist. And then once they have that thumb tucked into their fist, they're going to deviate their wrist to the ulnar side and hold. And as they do this, if there's pain at the distal radius, that's going to be a positive Finkelstein test. Now, the most important thing to remember for the Finkelstein test is that you're testing for decurvane tenosynovitis, but you need to know the two things you're testing it for. So we're talking about the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. And that's a very high yield test question. They're going to ask you which of the following structures are damaged or are implicated in the dysfunction. And you need to know 
abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. So we need a good mnemonic to remember that. So the way that I think about the Finkelstein test is I think about someone in their fist or in their hand holding an apple. And I say that an apple tastes good with every precious bite. Apple, APL, abductor pollicis longus, every precious bite, EPB, extensor pollicis brevis. So it's a beautiful mnemonic. This served me so well back in the day. Free points, I'm telling you. Free points. The Finkelstein test shows up all the time. They could explain it to you and ask you what's going on. They could show you a video of this and ask you what's going on. Decrevain tenosynovitis. Apple in every precious bite, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis. So that's it for this video. These are the special diagnostic tests that are very high yield for OMM that show up on Comlex, show up on in-class exams. You might be asked to perform this in your OMM lab. You never know. So all of this information, extremely high yield. I hope that this video, which was sort of like a rapid run through with some mnemonics, was useful to you. Uh, keep up the great work studying guys. I know that a lot of you are in dedicated right now. I see a lot of the comments. I'm checking my DMS on Instagram and Twitter. So I, I know that everyone's working really hard. Just wanted to say, keep up the magnificent work.